Good morning to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Thursday, October 26, 2017. Let's take a look at what's happening out there. Kind of a complex situation setting up in both the Western Caribbean, also the Eastern Pacific, and what all of this will mean eventually for a good deal of, well, pretty much this region all the way up through into Maine, believe it or not but not from a hurricane or a tropical storm developing, I'm pretty sure of that, but a complex weather situation nonetheless. So let's see what we've got in the current situation. Here is Invest Area 93L, located pretty much right over Nicaragua today, the center of it, a broad area of low pressure that is. And with that pl close proximity to land over the next day or so, uh, not much development expected, but Environmental conditions are expected to be conducive for the system to become more organized from tomorrow and into Saturday as it moves away from land down there in the northwestern Caribbean. But then strong upper level winds associated with an approaching cold front, and that sucker is going to be a powerful one, will probably start to shear the system, and then some very interesting things will begin to happen after that, and we're going to get into that in a moment. In the meantime, on the other side, now keep in mind, 93L is located right in here. And of course, it's not orange, but that's where it's located. In fact, let's just make this accurate. It's a yellow X, and it's right in here. And then this is Eastern Pacific Invest Area 92E. The E is for Eastern Pacific. Now, this has a 60% chance of development over the next few days. And the track of this system is going to be very close to land through here, bringing heavy rain. And it may go on to develop into a tropical depression or even a tropical storm. But the close proximity of these two features to each other is likely keeping them each separately from becoming stronger on their own. And if we look at the satellite animation, you can see how close they are to each other. This is 93L. And over here is 92E. And yeah, that very large area of energy with the land kind of splitting them down the middle, competing for the latent heat in the area. Uh, it's just not, it's not healthy for both of them to be so close to each other. If either of them are going to try to develop the process, just gets inhibited, which is a good thing because I am here to tell you, as I wrote in my blog today, let's just assume for the sake of argument that this was all by itself and this was not here and this was well on its way to becoming a storm and then eventually a hurricane as it moved up into the, to the Northwest Caribbean. Assuming that that happened and it's not going to, I think at the most this could become a tropical storm, but that's stretching it, I really think. But let's just pretend that this became a solid hurricane and let's just say it was a, a 100 mile per hour Cat 2 and it moved up through here and then turned the corner and then started coming up the east coast as this trough comes in. I'm telling you, I think that that would have been a catastrophic event because as it stands now with just uh, this just being a disturbance and, you know, representing a lot of heat and energy down in the tropics, we're going to get a heck of a storm out of that, I do believe. So had this been a hurricane getting pulled into this big trough, uh, I think it could have been a really calamitous event, maybe even like a Sandy Part 2, and I'll explain that in just a minute. So we're very lucky, considering I think what's going to happen in terms of what could have happened had this been more organized, more intense, and deeper and stronger, etc. Uh, because really there is a lot of energy down here, and you have to remember that heat is energy. And all that moisture, all that latent heat in the atmosphere down there, all this bubbling up of the thunderstorm activity, that represents all of that heat energy getting released in the form of convection and as such condensation into the atmosphere. Rainfall releases that heat into the atmosphere, and there is a lot of it down there. That's where you get into the thermodynamics and the physics of meteorology. But for the layperson, when you see this kind of uh, bubbling up of the clouds and you know that it's late October, I mean, just look up here. Clear skies, uh, much lower dew points, even South Florida really enjoying it. 
you know that this time of year when you get these strong troughs coming in, interacting with these large areas of heat, they don't have to be that intense like a hurricane. And as I mentioned, thank goodness for that, right? Uh, because this is going to be interesting enough and perhaps impactful enough as it is. So real quick, looking at the model guidance, really not very helpful. I just thought I'd throw this on. It's it's really you just have to just watch and see what happens with this. The track guidance, uh, not very meaningful. There's really not anything to track. No meaningful vortex just yet or a center of circulation. But this gives you the idea that overall, I guess the system is going to move northward into the open portions of the Northwest Caribbean Sea. Uh, but the thing that I'm interested in is the intensity and not for the usual reasons. You know, oh, is it going to be strong and be a tropical storm or a hurricane? I'm not as much worried about that as I am just looking at the trend in the modeling here. And you can see what's happening that from about 24 to roughly 60 hours, the time frame there, uh, it looks like that there is a period where this could ramp up and all of the guidance with the except, exception of the LGEM does ramp this up into a tropical storm. Why would it do that? Well, it would be sensing that the upper level winds will relax enough that the convection can consolidate and become uh, a tropical depression or a tropical storm. Now, this doesn't mean that it has to, for sure, uh, but it means that the potential is definitely there especially as it moves away from land. In the eastern Pacific, looking at 92E, again, the track guidance, eh, a little bit helpful here. Um, this is the new replacement to the beta and advection models we used to have. I need to look into these more. They, they seem to have some weird output lately. Uh, this season is their first year being run. The tab D, the tab M, and the tab S I'm assuming those are the replacements for the shallow, the medium, and the deep versions of these tab models, which admittedly I know very little about, but we will correct that for 2018 and maybe the models. I mean, look, it comes up here and it does this kind of weird thing. And you remember even in the deep tropics, you would see them going like this. It was just, they're strange. But nevertheless, back on topic, generally this should move in towards El Salvador and Guatemala. Uh, heavy rainfall is the biggest threat, but this has the bigger potential, the higher potential of developing into a tropical storm. If we look at the intensity guidance, uh, some of it here uh, indicating maybe a hurricane, uh, but overall the intensity consens consensus is that this becomes a tropical storm in the southeast Pacific. And once again, referring back to this satellite image, if this were not here at all, I believe this would be on its way, especially as it moves away from land, to becoming a much stronger system than we're going to see. That being said, it's not entirely out of the question that 93L becomes Tropical Storm Philippe, but I'm not counting on it. Let's just put it that way. I'm not, I'm not sure that it's going to. Now, this is where things get really interesting. And again, these are great model uh, maps output from Levi Cowan and his website tropicaltidbits.com. This is the current setup, and you can see this very deep trough over the eastern United States, and this is responsible for bringing all that very heavy rain up into portions of New England as of late, and this will move on through as we go through the different maps. Our d disturbance as well to the south down here, and let's choose a different color. We'll use white, so that'll show up better. Maybe, if I can, yep, good. So this is the current map. If we go out to 24 hours, uh, you know, lots of energy coming in out of Canada. Uh, things kind of try to flatten out, at least in the southern part of the region. And then down in the tropics, things are trying to get together at uh, 48 hours. Really no big changes, but then here comes this piece of energy diving out of Canada. That swings through. And then at 72 hours, it really starts to deepen. And at this point, the Euro is showing low pressure right here over the Keys, not very strong. It might not be sensing it. Maybe it's going to be small enough. Again, if it becomes a tropical storm, it's going to be rather disorganized 
and you know not your classic shape or anything like that but it could certainly bring tropical storm conditions to the keys heavy rain with squalls and uh, again as i mentioned in my blog this morning maybe some scattered power outages maybe there are some areas if you get 35 40 45 mile per hour wind gusts that were weakened in the wake of Irma but the power didn't go out maybe this is enough to to do it in so to speak so don't be surprised if there are some scattered power outages down here as a result of this system with some very heavy rain and occasional squally weather and, and gusty winds so this is 72 hours out you see this deep very deep what we call Mary O'Donnell flow just a very deep trough in the atmosphere and if this represents heat energy this represents energy in the upper levels of the atmosphere of a different sort a lot of dynamic energy coming in trying to phase and capture with this heat energy down here if this were January and there was enough Arctic air in place we would be talking about the potential of a massive blizzard but usually you don't have tropical connections in January so that's probably pretty far-fetched to even assume then if we go to 96 hours uh, right here on October 30th just a day after the five-year anniversary of Sandy it's interesting that right off the coast the euro and this is very fast moving from you know um, what is that Saturday night to Sunday night very quickly up the coast here the euro deepens it with some kind of an appendage to the south and east and this is where things really do get complicated but nevertheless yeah that's 982 right there and just pressure wise you know there are hurricanes that have pressure of 982 um, so that's got to be an eye-opener no pun intended and if these two low pressure areas combine and you don't have this appendage sitting down here and everything kind of bundles together in this trough and phases properly this could end up being a very substantial storm with the potential of hurricane force winds up here in New England uh, in some isolated areas that wouldn't surprise me I'm, I'm seeing a lot of chatter about it but the uncertainty since we're talking about four days plus that's still a lot I mean you know when we deal with hurricanes how things are and the same holds true with this um, there's still enough time that it might not be so bad and we all say whoo that was a close call or things come into clearer focus that maybe this low pressure area is stronger down here and it gets entrained into this trough as to one giant well not so much giant as intense I think giant implies aerial coverage like something's very large in size this could be more intense than we're seeing now it's just hard to say but this is what the European is showing them by day five I mean look at that 969 millibars up here in southeast Canada uh, very very strong westerly winds coming across New England and southeast Canada as the system merges with that big upper level trough of low pressure in the atmosphere again if this were winter time it would usher in very cold air behind it uh, luckily it's only October into well there you go that's Halloween so a a blustery Halloween for Maine northern New England etc looks to be in the works so what's the takeaway from all of this well once again you folks down here especially Western Cuba the Cayman Islands South Florida the Keys etc maybe tropical storm conditions but you know that's more of an overall description of the weather don't worry about whether or not it's a depression or a storm in terms of the definition worry about the impact here and I'm thinking squally weather heavy rain from time to time maybe tropical storm force winds in gusts and maybe some scattered power outages and then from there the rest is really you know we gotta wait another day or so that this region could see one heck of a storm or not and I know that sounds kinda of wishy-washy but hey that's the way it is and just to kinda of show you uh, a little bit of how this is playing out in the weather service world this is just an example uh, out of Belmar New Jersey and if you scroll down and you look at the forecast discussion uh, and you read through the short term down here to Saturday night through Monday 
and it's starting to show up here in the discussion. Fairly high agreement continues with both the operational models and the ensembles uh, for a strong cold front moving through. With a developing area of low pressure along it, the system will transport moisture, and they talk about that coming from the Caribbean, uh, and there might be some convective activity. The wind fields have come down a little bit, which is good, uh, but you know, this could go back and forth, you never know. But this is starting to show up in the discussions, uh, and even in the, uh, the five day, seven day forecast here of some of these areas, this is what we call point and click. You can see here in this time frame, let's go back to red or something. Um, Sunday, Saturday night, Sunday, you know, heavy rain and breezy. Um, so it's starting to show up there, and just as an example, the same thing holds true up here in Portland, Maine. I told you it's going to cover a large area here. Uh, heavy rain and breezy Sunday into Sunday night. And then you can read their forecast discussion as well. I'll just take a quick gander. And by the way, just like with hurricanes, these discussions really help you to understand the reasoning behind what they are expecting. And just looking through here in their long-term discussion, um, the focus of the extended is on the next frontal boundary, etc. And then they talk about a similar evolution. Let's see down. I'm just trying to read through here. Uh, rapid cyclogenesis occurring along the next frontal boundary. And that's what we're talking about here, that low pressure area. Uh, and the evolution is displayed on the Canadian, the GFS, and the Euro. It is possible that low level potential vortex or vorticity anomalies from the convection, uh, coupled with the upper level potential vortex anomaly pinched off from the wave breaking is leading to rapid cyclogenesis when these features phase in the vertical. This is very technical, obviously, but basically, when you look at that, you say, my goodness, it looks like the potential is there for one heck of a storm system. So I'm going to be on top of it, and we'll see what tomorrow shows. All right, so there you go. A little bit of a wake-up call for folks along the East Coast, uh, especially the Mid-Atlantic and into New England and the Northeast um, cities. You think about New York. Manhattan, Eastern Long Island, Boston, the Cape, Down East Maine, and maybe even the Jersey Coast uh, and Cape Hatteras. You know, those all could be impacted by this. So stay tuned. Uh, very interesting few days ahead. All right, that's all I've got for now. Again, I am Mark Sutter for HurricaneTrack.com. As always, thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll be back tomorrow morning with an update on how all of this unfolds.